So I've done a lot of videos about finding and restoring good antique woodworking tools. But I've also had a lot of viewers get in touch and tell me that they live in places where old tools are either too expensive or they just don't exist. So it seems to me like we're going to have to change direction in this channel a little bit. If we can't find good woodworking tools, well, we're just going to have to make them. I think the best place to start is to make some planes. They're good, all-around useful tools for pretty much any woodworking application. And if we're going to make our planes, we probably should make them out of wood. Because, well, we're woodworkers. If there's one thing we've got plenty of, it's wood. Now, you might be asking, Rex, do you actually know anything about wooden planes? And, yeah, a little. I use wooden planes a lot in my day-to-day -day woodworking, and I find that they work just as well as metal planes. They're a little bit trickier to adjust, but they're also lighter, they don't need to be lubricated, and they're less fragile. You can actually drop them on the floor, and they're usually fine. Drop a cast iron plane on the floor, and it typically shatters. Luckily, making wooden planes actually isn't all that difficult. I've made a couple of them myself. And I wouldn't call it easy, but it's well within the reach of anybody who has basic manual skills. So even if you're not a great woodworker yet, you can probably make a pretty decent plane. And woodworkers have actually been making their own planes for a really long time. This plane right here has no maker's mark, so I'm pretty sure the craftsman made it himself out of a little scrap of beach that he had left over from some other job. Making the plane was well within the skills of the average cabinet maker several hundred years ago. But that cabinet maker ran into the same problem that we're going to run into, which is you can make the plane, but you got to get the iron from somewhere. Now for a long time, the plane maker could go to his local blacksmith and just have an iron made. And today, you can buy an iron. That's not the problem. The problem is they're a little pricey. So, for instance, Ron Hock makes a bunch of excellent plain irons that are really highly regarded, but they cost about 50 bucks each. And for me, as somebody who's used to spending like 5 or $10 per plane, I'll be damned if I'm going to spend 50 bucks on a plane and then still have to build the plane. That's just crazy talk. But at the same time, we also live in the most industrialized age in the history of the world. There's more stuff floating around than there's ever been before. So for a long time, it seemed to me like it shouldn't be difficult just to find a piece of high carbon steel and make a plane iron out of it. I mean, a plane iron is something you should be able to go down to Walmart and buy for like $2. So there has to be some simple consumer product that I can just turn into a plane iron with a minimal amount of effort. Now I've spent years collecting flea market plane irons and looking all over for a good source of cheap, high carbon steel stock or even tool steel that I could harden and heat treat at home to use for making plane irons. And so far, everything I've found has been expensive enough that it hasn't seemed like a good way to make a really good, inexpensive plane. But recently I found something that I'm excited about. This humble looking little piece of metal here is a blade from an edger. You know, one of those things that you drive along the side of your garden or your driveway to get the weeds out of the way? Well, this is the spinning blade that actually chops the grass. It's made by the Echo Company, and they advertise it as being hardened steel, which means that it has to be high carbon steel to start with. Now, one thing that's really amazing about this is that if you compare it to the size of a plain iron, they're dead on. This is exactly the size that you would want. And this is a pretty big piece. You wouldn't need all of it. You could cut it right in half where that hole is and get two decent size irons. They'd be perfect for wooden planes. And these things go for about $12 to $16 a pack for a pack of four. So if you cut them in half, you'd get eight irons, which is a lot, and the cost would be about $2 per iron. And that'd be perfect. So if this really is a piece of hardened, high-carbon steel, I should be able to just cut it, grind it, hone it, and put it directly in a plane. The only thing is, I'm not going to trust some corporation that tells me this product is hardened steel just because they say it is. I'm going to do some tests. Now we need to know a little bit of metallurgy before we start testing so we even know what we're looking for. Now, steel 
is a combination of iron and carbon. It's an alloy of those two things. But the important thing is you can't just put the iron and carbon together. That's not going to do it. The iron has to be heated up enough so that the carbon actually dissolves and the two of them fuse together on the molecular level and they're bonded that way. That's what makes them an alloy. If you don't have that, you don't have steel. For instance, this piece of cast iron is full of carbon. It's got tons of it. But the iron and the carbon are just mixed together. They're not alloyed with one another. And that makes this cast iron soft and brittle. It's not at all appropriate for making a plain iron or a knife blade. But if you want to make a tool, like this chisel, it's not enough just to mix iron and carbon together. Even if you fuse them and make an alloy, you need to get exactly the right amount of carbon in to get something that you can make a blade out of. For instance, if you put in just a tiny little bit of carbon, about 0.25%, you end up with this. It's mild steel. And this is what pretty much every steel object in your life is made out of. We make buildings out of it, washers, dryers, appliances, lamps, everything. Because it's a great material. It's cheap, it's durable, and it's flexible. But it's a little bit too flexible. It can't be hardened, and it won't hold an edge, because compared to other steels, it's pretty soft. Now on the other hand, if you add too much carbon, more than 2%, then you just end up back at cast iron again, which is too soft and brittle to hold an edge and won't make a knife. What you have to do is add exactly the right amount of carbon, usually right around 1%, and that gives you a tool steel or a high carbon steel like this. And this has the special property of being hardenable which means when you heat it up red hot and then plunge it into water or oil like the amazing knife maker Green Beetle is doing in this shot right here, it causes the steel to become much, much harder and more brittle. And that's really important because that means it'll hold an edge and keep the edge for a long time. Now the question is, is our little plain iron that we're working with here really made of that high carbon steel. Is it hardened? Well, the company says it is, but I don't trust them. So, time to run some tests. Now, I don't have any fancy testing equipment like a Rockwell hardness tester, like they would have in a lab or a machine shop. But luckily there are some really good tests we can just run at home. The first thing we're going to use is just a standard three-corner file. Files are made from high carbon steel and they're hardened as hard as they possibly can be, which is why they cut so many things. So, if I put in something significantly softer than the file, like this piece of cast iron, we can see that the file cuts it easily. You see that shiny metal coming out under the top layer of oxide. This cast iron is much softer than the file. <clears throat> now we can put in our piece of mild steel. It's a lot harder than cast iron, but it should reveal some of the same things. Right here at the edge, you see that the file is biting in easily. And you see that bright metal as the file grinds away the steel. I can also use the point of the file right here and gouge the surface. And you can see that the surface of the steel is very easy to gouge. The file bites right in and leaves really visible scratch marks. So this is not hardened steel and it's not high carbon because it's much softer than our file. Next I'm going to take a known piece of hardened high carbon steel. This is an old blade out of a Stanley block plane. It's too short and beat up for me to be useful, so it's good for testing. Now when you take a file to a piece of steel like this, it feels very different. Do you hear that sound? That ring and that zipping noise? That's called skating. That's when the file just moves across the piece of steel without biting in. If I work it on the edge, nothing really happens. And if I take the point and try to dig into the surface, even pushing down hard, nothing much. Now here's the real test. 
we'll put in our edger blade and see how it reacts to the file. First I'll try the edge. Hmm. See, this is interesting. Hold on. You can see that the file, it does appear to be biting in there a little bit. So, I'm not really sure what's going on. Let me try to scratch the surface of it with the tip of the file and see what happens. Okay, so this is definitely not skating. It's not doing what I expected. Um, the file's digging in. And that's not what I was hoping for. But there's also some sort of coating on this. It could be a black oxide, it could be some sort of paint. They obviously want to protect these from rust. So I can't be 100% sure of what's happening here. Um, I'm gonna need a better test. Luckily, I can take this to the grinder. Hey, real quick, I'd just like to remind you that this video, like all of my videos, is sponsored by Patreon. I'd like to say thank you to my newest patrons, Paul Desjardins and Paul and Helen Kruger, who are my mom and dad. So as new patrons, they're gonna get access to my patron feed with all sorts of exclusive content, articles, pictures, behind the scenes stuff, sneak peeks at upcoming projects, and early access to all of my videos. So if you're interested in seeing some of the benefits I have for patrons, go to patreon.com slash rexkruger. And thanks very much. Now since that file test was kind of inconclusive, we're going to need to go with something a little bit more precise. Luckily, you can learn a lot about a piece of steel by taking it to a grinding wheel and seeing what kind of sparks it throws off. So for instance, when I take this piece of cast iron to the grinding wheel, I'm going to get orange, kind of dark colored sparks. They're not going to go very far and they're not going to burst very much. There also won't be very many of them. That's going to indicate the low content of carbon actually fused with the iron. So I'm going to get a dull orange look from this. When I take the mild steel over, I should get a noticeably brighter spark with some more bursting at the long ends of the sparks. And that's going to tell me that there's more carbon fused in here. Now what I'm really hoping is that these two samples are going to look really similar to one another. This is the Stanley Plain Iron. It should give me a bright, whitish spark, long trails, and lots of bursting. That's going to indicate a hardened, high carbon steel. Hopefully, when I go to do this one, it's going to look really similar. Now, according to the grinder, which is the best test I have, this looks like a piece of high carbon, hardened steel. So the only thing to do left is to cut it, shape it, flatten the back, grind a bevel, and hone it, just like I would any other iron. So here's our final product. And I got to admit, I'm pretty happy with it. It looks and feels so much like a real plain iron that you would buy in a store or find in a professional tool. I was able to hone it to a razor sharp edge. I mean, this thing is really sharp. And just doing some handheld tests, it even cuts wood really nicely. Now, that still doesn't tell us everything that we need to know. You can get even a piece of mild steel honed to a sharp edge, but it won't hold that edge over time. And that's why hardening is important. So, in order to really figure out what's going on with this, I'm going to have to put it in a plane. But I don't have any planes that will fit this iron, so I'm going to make one. My next project is going to be to figure out the easiest and quickest good plane that you can build in the home workshop with modest tools. So, make sure you stick around and come back in two weeks when I'll have that video ready. Or, if you're a patron, you're going to see it next week. Now, there's a couple of things I should mention about this. One of them is that since I first got this edger blade, the price of them has changed. Echo is now selling a two-pack of these instead of a four-pack for $14 or $15. So the price of a single iron like this isn't going to be $2, it's going to be $4. And I've got an affiliate link in the description if you want to pick those up and try to make those. Um, it really helps me out if you click on that link. I also found on Amazon a very similar iron that looks honestly exactly the same. It's just generic, and that's four blades for, I think, $10. I've got a link to that one, too. 
And so you might want to buy those and experiment because they're going to be really, really inexpensive. Now, if you're interested in plain making and you want to follow along with this, but you don't want to make your own iron, I've also linked to the Hawk Tools irons and to the Veritas wooden plane kit. Um, these are excellent ways to go if you have a little bit more money and just want to get into plane making. But for the rest of us, we're going to stick with the super basic, ultra cheap approach. Speaking of being basic and cheap, you might have seen me use a few tools here that you don't have. You might not have a big stationary belt sander or a really good grinder. You might not have an angle grinder to cut through this with, and you can't cut it with a hacksaw. It's too hard for that. Um, but it's completely doable with tools that you're going to have in a standard basement or a garage workshop. So don't let anything intimidate you. This is not a difficult process. It requires no heat treatment. You just have to reshape and regrind the blade and then hone it. So, this channel's got a whole new direction now. We're going to focus much more on making tools and figuring out how to craft the best things for our shop at the lowest prices. I'm excited about the new direction we're taking. This iron is really good, but it's just the beginning. So, stick around because there's a lot more great stuff coming. And thanks for watching.